Welcome to this morning, this day, and this opportunity to be together in community, which is a time of joy, comfort, and sometimes challenges. People's Unitarian Universalist Congregation is a place where we come to learn more about being human. We, we're not here because we figured out life's questions or because we think we've got it right. We come here to learn more about being in relationship together, how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another. My name is Becky Moffat Moore, and I'm from the Sunday Services Committee. I would like to extend a welcome to everyone gathered here this morning, though we are spread afar, whether you're new or a regular at People's Church, to those of you who are visitors to our service or here for the first time, thank you for being with us today. Now let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with each other, honest with ourselves, and opening to connections in all forms. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from a poem by Molly Brewer, When Things Aren't Okay. And if you're lighting a chalice at home, you are encouraged to type in a chat box, a chalice has been lit in your neighborhood, your city, your street, or your community. My beloved people, I cannot pretend, and so I will not tell you that everything is okay right now. There is, that I will not tell you that everything is okay right now, that there is no reason to be angry and that you must be optimistic or at peace. I cannot pretend these things and so I won't tell them to you, but now our chalice is lit. And so all I ask in this moment is that we remember the words of Rebecca Parker. There is a love, there is a love holding us, there is a love holding all. By the light of our chalice, let us rest in that love. People's people are supported, support one another in life, in good times and in difficult times. One of the ways we do this is by taking time out in the service to share important personal milestones and changes impacting our lives, whether joyful or sorrowful. If you have a personal issue you wish to, you wish to share, enter it along with your name in the chat box and I will read it and place a stone in the bowl. The mixing ripples of water signify how we are all interconnected. You may also ask that a stone be placed in the bowl without making a statement. I will pause the service recording now to maintain privacy. I will now place extra tone stones for the joys and the sorrows that remain unspoken.
sources of reason and radiance, sources of courage and compassion, keep watch over those who work or watch or weep this day. May the suffering be soothed. May the weary find rest. May the sick be tended. May the dying and those who love them find peace. May the joyous be shielded. And may all of us know that we are all wrapped in a love that surrounds us always, a web that connects us to all that exists. Our meditation today will be a silent meditation. So to prepare yourself for silent meditation, I ask that you sit comfortably here with your feet on the floor and no body parts crossed. Take a long, steady, deep breaths. Release worries and anxieties. Let yourself be fully present. Slowly, as you are ready, become aware of your surroundings and know that you are encompassed by love. This morning's offering comes from The Greater Good for Ourselves in Our World, written by Kayla Parker. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively to do a great, greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and, and grow the life and mission of this Congress. May we give in love and in hope.
Giving thanks for all that sustains us. Please say with me, the words can be found in the chat box. For the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. Our presenter today is David Isaacson. David was a college professor, English professor becoming a reference and humanities librarian at Western University for 33 years 
before retiring in 2005. He helped found a book discussion group at the Kalamazoo Public Library called Classics Revisited. David has led a short story discussion group at Friendship Village and is a grandfather and great father. Grand, great grandfather, please welcome David. And this is what Jesus means, I think, in this very passage when he says, love your enemy. And it's significant that he does not say like your enemy. Like is a sentimental something, an affectionate something. There are a lot of people that I find it difficult to like. I don't like what they do to me. I don't like what they say about me and other people. I don't like their attitudes. I don't like some of the things they're doing. I don't like them. But Jesus says, love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding, redemptive goodwill for all men so that you love everybody because God loves them. You refuse, you refuse to do anything that will defeat an individual because you have agape in your soul. And here you come to the point that you love the individual who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. This is what Jesus means when he says, love your enemy. This is the way to do it. When the opportunity presents itself, when you can defeat your enemy, you must not do it. Now, this is from a sermon Martin Luther King delivered at the Dexter Avenue First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama on November 17, 1957. This is from a book Gandhi wrote called Young India. When a person claims to be nonviolent, he is expected not to be angry with one who has injured him. He will not wish him harm. He will wish him well. He will not swear at him. He will not cause him any physical hurt. He will put up with all the injury to which he is subjected by the wrongdoer. Thus, nonviolence is complete innocence. Complete nonviolence is complete absence of ill will against all that lives. It therefore embraces even subhuman life, not excluding noxious insects or beasts. They've not been created to feed our destructive propensities. If we only knew the mind of the Creator, we should find their proper place in His creation. Nonviolence is therefore, in its active form, goodwill towards all life. It is pure love. I read it in the Hindu scriptures, in the Bible, and in the Koran. This is a poem by Wendell Berry called Enemies. If you are not to become a monster, you must care what they think. If you care what they think, how will you not hate them? And so become a monster of the opposite kind? From where then is love to come? Love for your enemy. That is the way of liberty. From forgiveness, forgiven. They go free of you and you of them. They are to you as sunlight on a green branch. You must not think of them again, except as monsters like yourself, pitiable because unforgiving. I didn't dislike him. I didn't hate him. No, I loathed him. I wanted him to suffer for the wrongs he'd done me. I wanted revenge. Justice dictated that my enemy pay for what he did to me. I wanted to obey the Old Testament stricture, an eye for an eye. But then I remembered the New Testament stricture, love your enemy. Mind you, the Old Testament isn't only about anger, nor is the New Testament only about love. But this line from the Sermon on the Mount is startling. Christianity gets no more radical than this. I just can't imagine tolerating my enemies, letting alone loving them. 
Hate is often easy, love often hard. But maybe the people I have called enemies were really just opponents, people who disagreed with me, but didn't really hate my guts. If that's the case, then maybe I can soften these words of Jesus. Maybe Jesus meant love your enemies to be an ideal goal, not actually something you had to do in order to be a good person. But no, Jesus did not say love your opponent or try to love your enemies. I doubt if Jesus was pussyfooting around. I was just a kid when I acquired enemies. I was bullied in grade school through high school because I wasn't always a stereotypical boy's boy. I did my share of roughhousing and other typical boy's behavior, but I preferred reading books rather than living in the so-called real world. I was not a team player. Bullies beat me up and they always won. I had no perspective on these guys. I couldn't step out of myself to try to understand the world through their eyes. All I knew was that if they hated me, I was going to hate them back. I can remember only one of these seeming enemies. He was a tackle on the football team. Many years later, when I was giving a talk at one of our class reunions, I was puffed up with the pleasure of reminiscing on our good old days. My pleasure was much diminished, however, when I saw my former oppressor distinctly not smiling like everyone else in the room. No, my nemesis was staring at me fixedly like a basilisk with what looked like the same hatred of all those many years before. Okay, this is hardly a deeply traumatic experience. I wasn't a victim of brutal torture, a survivor of a concentration camp. But still, within the privileged position of my rather sheltered life, this guy was still my enemy. He had not simply rented a room in my head. He'd taken possession of the whole house. But this encounter, however painful, was transient. Later in life, I acquired much more formidable enemies. 30 years or so ago, in the late 1980s and 1990s, I was at the center of a serious conflict where I worked. I immediately liked a new colleague of mine. Uh, let's call him John. John seemed to be a soulmate. We shared a deep love of books. I admired John's intellect. I envied his Harvard undergraduate degree. Though we didn't work in the same department, I sought out his company and we worked together in committees. But then out of the blue, John didn't ask me to do something. He ordered me to do it. He wasn't an administrator with the authority to order me to do anything. Uh, this many years later, I've forgotten what he wanted me to do that I found so offensive. But that's not important. It was the tone, not the substance of what he said, that got my goat. We were sitting by ourselves at a table in the cafeteria. All I recall is that our disagreement soon escalated into something close to a shouting match before we stopped, before we might be seen to be making a scene. I walked away from this confrontation feeling very hurt and angry. This was the beginning of a conflict that quickly got worse. The snowball was on its inevitable and unerring way to hell. John didn't just lord it over me. He acted like a miniature Mussolini toward other colleagues as well, some of whom just didn't have the gumption to oppose it. He got away with his meanness because the people who ran my place of employment allowed him to. Complaints to our boss got nowhere. He dismissed the com complaints by saying, oh, that's just John being John. Cut him some slack. This failure to take our complaint seriously just fed the flames. John was a cunning villain. He taunted me, not just in private, 
but in public, at meetings, and in a new medium of communication called email. He would have been even more vicious had Facebook and Twitter been invented. John became my personal Donald J. Trump. As the conflict got venomous, I discovered long dormant parts of myself, spite, contempt, anger, sometimes verging on rage, led to alcoholic drinking, loss of sleep, and revenge fantasies. Beneath my justified anger at wrongs done to me and my friends was fear. Objectively, I didn't have all that much to fear from John, but I couldn't stop being angry with him. But suddenly, without any advance warning, John had a heart attack at work and died a few hours later in the hospital. My first reaction to this news was nothing I'm proud of. After the initial shock, I was glad the wicked tyrant was dead. Fortunately, I quickly got over that feeling. I attended his memorial service, during which I learned some fine things about this man I had so admired when he first joined our staff. It has taken me 30-some years to come to terms with my very contradictory feelings towards John. It's only now that I understand how much my feelings toward him said more about me than him. Was he really my enemy? I let him humiliate me, and I let some of those feelings fester. I didn't have the wisdom to turn a bad thing, humiliation, into a good thing, humility. I don't hate John anymore, and that's not just because he's dead. No, it's not just that time heals all wounds, either. If we stop hating, we have an opportunity to learn something positive. So, I return to those words from the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it hath been said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. One of the lessons I've learned from this experience is that I have a right to hate the sin, but not the sinner. Resentment is poisonous. Hatred towards others can morph into hatred of yourself. We should try to forgive our enemies. Forgiveness is an important ingredient in love. If we forgive, we give something back to the person who has injured us. But more importantly, we give something we have loved back to ourselves. We come to feel compassion. To be compassionate is to feel a passion of love so strong, we understand at least some of the pain our enemy has inflicted upon himself as well as on us. The passion of hatred can be transformed in the, into the compassion of forgiveness. As a Unitarian Universalist, I can absorb sources of right conduct that reflect what draws people universally together, such as the golden rule. It's not a silver or bronze rule, but a shimmering, precious, golden one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you doesn't mean if they hurt us, we should hurt unto them. It's easy to return love for love, but hard to return love for hate. We should seek empathy, not pity for others. Pity is sometimes condescending. We feel fortunate not to have the pain we see others suffering. There but for the grace of God go I may be a good starting place, but it's only pity. If we feel empathy, we identify with the suffering person. We try to imagine how that person feels. We aren't superior to that person, but equal. We try to live up to the UU's second principle, to seek justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. So can consider joining me in that difficult job. If you can't love your enemies, you can at least seek justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. May it be so, and may we make it so.
shortly we'll be breaking out into groups for discussion. The guidelines for discussion are please speak the truth as you understand it. To avoid inhibiting a flow of discussion, do not comment on others' comments until everyone has had a chance in the initial sharing. The questions will be listed in the chat box, but I'll read them out loud for those to, that don't have access to the chat box. Have you ever been consumed by hatred? And how have you dealt with it? What can we do to reduce the hatred and polarization that consumes our society? And have you ever found something good out of feelings of hatred? AV will now divide us into groups for discussion. People's Church is a beloved community embracing and serving our diverse world. Love everyone. This action may amaze some and confound others. Go in peace, go in hope, go in love. People who wish to participate in a virtual coffee hour are invited to stay for smaller group conversations. 